Good morning and welcome to our worship, to this worshiping congregation that joins us by way of a social media platform today. Thank you for joining us on this, the third Sunday after Pentecost. I'm Pastor Jim Cobb along with Pastor Patrick Ballard and Pastor Judy Cobb. And we have the assistance today of Dr. Daniel Oni with the organ and Sarah Berger as soloist and the filming today and the editing by John Miller and Nina Naki and Olivia Brand. And we're very grateful for their talents in this time. We're thankful that you join us today. We have some announcements for you. The Adult Forum continues to meet on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. with different topics. We're grateful for all who participate, and the e-notes on our website is the way that that gets communicated with a link. Also, we have Bible studies on Thursday evening, and we're grateful for participants who join us in that way as well. On this Sunday morning, we sing with the theme about the cross, You'll hear that recurring as we go through our worship today in many different ways, both with hymns and preludes, children's message, sermon, and the uh, hymns that we gather to sing. Thank you for being a part of our worship today. We begin our worship guided by the confession and the word of forgiveness. As the people of God to offer our repentance and praise, to pray for the unity of the church and the renewal of our common life. Trusting in God's mercy and compassion, let us ask for the forgiveness of our sins. Forgive us, Lord, for past mistakes, mistrust, and misdeeds. Lord, have mercy. Forgive us, Lord, for remaining in the darkness rather than seeking the path of light. For you, O Lord, are the only true light. Lord, have mercy. Forgive us, Lord, for our lack of faith and for our failure to be people of expectant hope and authentic charity. Lord, have mercy. Forgive us, Lord, for having caused pain hardship, and anguish to others. Lord, have mercy. Forgive us, Lord, for self-absorption and remaining indifferent, instead of showing hospitality to all, especially strangers and refugees. Lord, have mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Teach us, good Lord God, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not count the cost, to fight and not heed the wounds, to toil and not seek for rest, to labor and not ask for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This reading is from the sixth chapter of Romans. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been baptized and buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear 
the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Jesus said to the 12, a disciple is not above the teacher nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. And whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Today is Father's Day, and we wanted to acknowledge that with a prayer petition that you'll hear later, but I wanted to speak it now. Compassionate God, you are with us, and we are never alone. Bless all fathers and father figures who strive to love and nurture as you do. Comfort all who long to be fathers and all for whom this day is difficult. Hear us, O God, for your mercy is great. I'd like to spend some moments with the children, and for that I'll move to the baptismal fund. Children, as you gather with me today, I wanted to talk about the cross. The cross is always connected to Jesus. When we see a cross, we think of Jesus. And that's what I would want you to know all the time. In the early church, sometimes when people prayed, they made a form of the cross with their body and their hands outstretched. And this was one of the early ways people prayed in the church. It's interesting, is it, that you can make a cross like this? Very often when people were taught to receive communion, they were taught to make a cross with their hands. And then they would place their hands like this cross in order to receive a wafer or the bread. A cross. Many people were taught to, ma taught to make the sign of the cross. In our Lutheran church, we had a saying that goes with it. Jesus, my Lord, comes down from heaven and through his sufferings, pointing to the right side, enters into my heart. So sometimes children were taught this phrase to make that sign of the cross. Jesus, my Lord, comes down from heaven and, and through his sufferings enters into my heart. So sometimes in our worship, we'll see that cross being remembered when we say the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the beginning of worship and in the benediction, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Today, I went around the church this week to collect some of the crosses that I found in our own church. 
this large cross was in the Bible class in the early history of this church. It now sits in a coffee hour room, and we looked at that. This cross is one that is in our chapel on the altar. This cross is called a processional cross that leads people into our worship and leads people from our worship back into our world. It's usually carried by the person we call a crucifer. The cross that I am wearing is one that was given to me by Pastor Judy on a 25th anniversary of my ordination. It was from a shop, a Greek island called Mykonos, and it has many different colors attached to it. Also, we had this cross in one of our Sunday school rooms. We had this cross that was a model for the one that we find in some of our upstairs second floor worship space. It's a huge cross up there, but this is a model of the kind of strands of metal that were made for that cross. This is one that hangs in my office. It is inserted inside a frame and hangs on a wall. This is one from our home with kind of multicolors of wood. And even from our preschool, there was one made out of blocks. Blocks that say, I love Jesus, or it says, Jesus loves me. That was a unique cross. And on this very stole that the pastors wear, this is one of Pastor Judy's that was given at her ordination with all the different kinds of crosses that we can see through church history, different crosses that are made. Your imaginations can also see crosses in different places. I remember as a child thinking that after I saw the cross, I could also see it in window panes. If I was in a, in a car traveling somewhere, I could see crosses that look like telephone poles. But wherever crosses appear, it's connected with remembering Jesus. And that's what we need to know about this sign that we have. This sign of the cross is remembering Jesus following Jesus, being with Jesus. So it is so true that you could draw a picture today of different ways that crosses can be shaped and formed. You might take a piece of paper and do that today. You might hand that cross as a gift to fathers because fathers and mothers once gathered with you at the baptismal font and during the service when you were incorporate, brought into the people of God, the sign of the cross was put on your forehead. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. So truly when we make that sign of the cross, Jesus, my Lord, came down from heaven, through his sufferings, enters into my heart. The sign of the cross follows us in so many places even out there in our world. And where we see the cross, we remember Jesus. Let me have a prayer with you, please. Dear God, thank you for the cross always bringing to our minds and our hearts our Lord Jesus. Thank you that we have that sign placed on us at our baptisms and forever renewed when we make signs of the cross, when we see the cross, and when we follow you by living the cross. Be with us today and always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace to you today and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus says, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. 
Now, just as the cross takes many symbols, many forms, so too our cross-bearing can look different to different people. Our former ELCA bishop, H. George Anderson, once said that cross-bearing is not a passive kind of circumstance that comes to you, like having to have your mother-in-law live with you. It's not even some illness or disease that randomly happens to us. These may be true thorn-in-the-flesh things, but for us those are not cross-bearing. Cross-bearing, rather, is the will, the will to take up some cause or issue or circumstance that you knowingly and willingly embrace for the sake of your neighbor. It's not a passive circumstance, but an active taking up something that is Christ-like in a true sacrifice of your focus or your time or your treasure. It most likely is going to be risky, sacrificial, perhaps even produce suffering on your part as you give yourself for others. What a strange change in definition Jesus gives us. Our Lord Jesus is such a realist concerning this cross-bearing. He counsels that those who follow him will face opposition some of that opposition even comes within our family units, among the persons we most love. Be prepared, he says, for opposition, for rejection, or worse yet, subtle indifference. Mark Allen Powell is a New Testament professor at Trinity Lutheran Seminary in Columbus, Ohio, and in his book, Loving Jesus, he has a chapter entitled Sunday Morning, and he relates this story. He says, I remember talking to a Christian rock fan in Austin, Texas. He was a Jesus freak, just like I used to be and still want to be, and I envied him. He was just living in the joy of the Lord, reading the Bible every day and praying to Jesus and speaking in tongues and playing Christian rock music. He and I got into a conversation and I asked him about church. He didn't write it off, but he did say that he hadn't been able to find a congregation where he felt like he fit. The church where I'm a member, he said, is it's like something out of black and white TV. You know, Ozzy and Harry and Leave it to Beaver and all those ancient shows. Everybody dresses up in suits. They play this music that doesn't sound like anything on the radio. And the preacher talks about things that have nothing to do with my life. And I don't know, it's just boring. And so he said he didn't go. I asked him about finding a different church, but he didn't know about denominations and didn't really want to get into all that different doctrine stuff, so he just didn't go anywhere. Maybe when I'm older, I'll get more out of, he said, or maybe the church will, you know, just lighten up. Well, this time, says Mark Allen Powell, I did give advice, not knowing whether it was good advice or not, but I thought about it, and I said, do you love Jesus? He said, yes, I do. I love him with my whole heart. Would you die for him? Yes, I would. Wait, you would die for him, but you won't be bored with him? And so the professor went on and said, I think the Lord wants you to do this. I think Jesus wants you to get out of bed every Sunday morning and go to that Ozzie and Harriet church and just sit there for one hour being bored. Do it for him. Call it bearing your cross if you like. Just do it. Sometimes cross-bearing may look like giving some of our time, not just to the printed words in a book we call Bible, but time to be brought into the called, gathered, assembled, and living body of Christ so that the Word of God is received in community. 
This is the best practice for the church in Bible study and in worship. Not alone and isolated, but with others in community. Even in this awful sheltered life, isolated life we now live. Even as our gatherings occur by Zoom or social media platforms. I commend all of you who hang on to worship in this time through a medium we know so little about but so depend on now for our far-flung assembly that does gather in Christ's name. Ishmael Noko from Zimbabwe was once the executive director of Lutheran World Federation and he told me a story. He was in this country visiting some of our college campuses and he knew of three students from his home country of Zimbabwe who were attending one of those colleges he visited, and he asked about them and heard they had gotten into some minor disciplinary infractions, and so he visited them and called them together. He listened to them for a while before offering a kind but direct admonishment. He said, this is what I expect from you. Get yourselves back to church and stay there. Church was to be the stabilizing community for them in a new and strange world away from their homeland. They were to choose church folks to surround them and care for them instead of only college peer pressure that put them on a slippery slope. In one of our congregations, we had a member who was a child psychiatrist who taught fifth grade Sunday school. One day, a child raised their hand and said, I'm bored. And he replied, get used to it, a lot of life is like that. Well, that was no Sesame Street or Mr. Rogers' reply, but it was real and honest. Cross-bearing is risky, sometimes adventuresome, and yes, even sometimes boring, but always life-giving. I visited with a former parishioner once in the state of California, and he wanted me to be sure to step into one of the famous television churches, which I won't name, although the glass edifice was called Crystal. It was designed as a concert hall and a stage. Those church broadcasts mostly had interviews with famous people and a feel-good sermon every Sunday. I asked, is ever a cross used in worship? And the guide replied, well, we do have one on wheels behind the curtains, but the minister thinks it's such a symbol of negativity that it's seldom seen. As I've traveled across the world's landscape of churches in the U.S. and other countries, I can almost guarantee one consistent architectural feature of Lutheran churches is this. The cross is central. The cross will have a central place in the design of what we see and encounter. Why? Why is this so important for us? Simply put, the cross is the most visible sign of God's love for us and for all creation. When Jesus went all the way willingly into his suffering and death, it was a total and complete trust of God that none of us can ever, ever attain. Jesus, God's son, went to die on that Calvary cross, betrayed, spit upon, beaten, bruised, suffered until dying. And that death is what happens to every human being. But the death seen there that day was defeated when God raised Jesus on the third day and everything is forever changed. So much so that that Roman cross has been transformed from symbol of execution to the power of God's love for each and every one of us. That's why, why you'll see it placed in our churches, sign of God's love that goes all the way to death and through death to forgiveness and to new life. One of our hymns says it best, the cross speaks of a love that will not let me go. 
And finally, that cross will always be a compass for the followers of Jesus. Seeing his sacrificial love, we take up our crosses to follow him. We may endure, yes, some boredom, perhaps ridicule, certainly opposition or indifference. But followers of Jesus lead a cruciform life. Our lives may truly endure all kinds of thorns in the flesh issues. That's the cost of simply being human. Yet some will get beyond those thorns in the flesh nuisances and willingly instead take up the cross and follow him. Some will risk faithfulness to the gospel no matter the price. Some will take up a cause and advocate for those who have no voice. Some will put monies into providing for neighbors in needs. Some will follow with integrity of conscience into arenas where thoughts and words and deeds matter. And surely if God can love even the Judas who betrayed him, the Peter who denied him, and the Saul who persecuted him, then that love from his cross can draw us to him like a magnet. The cross for the Christian is a sign of God's love for us no matter what. The cross proclaims the love of Christ. The cross is to be taken up by us for the sake of the world, and together we'll keep trying to figure it out. We're called to a cruciform life. What does it mean? Where does it lead? What shall I do? Our prayer is, come Holy Spirit, and guide us into the ways of justice and peace, into that vision of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. It's all so risky. Come, Holy Spirit, and make me ready to take up the cross and go where you would have me go and speak what you would have me speak and do what you would have me do. Bearing the cross of Jesus is how we follow him. Pick it up. Go with it. The cross, the Christ, the church. Thanks be to God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
With the whole Christian church on earth, we recall the creed spoken on the day of our baptism that continues to shape our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Expanse of God, you bring diverse voices together to form your church. Open each of our hearts and unstop our ears to learn from one another. May we focus on our baptismal unity. Hear us, O oh God. Your Providing God, your creation shows us that the life comes from death. Renew the places where our land, air, and waterways have been ill for too long. Direct the work of all who care for birds and their habitats. Hear us, O oh God. Protecting God, sustain and keep safe all who work to defend across the world. Revive and strengthen organizations dedicated to caring for refugees and migrants while their homelands struggle for peace. Hear us, O oh God. Loving God, you promise to be with all who are persecuted for your sake. Guide all who speak your word of justice and console any who are tormented or targeted for being who they are. Hear us, O oh God. Compassionate God, you are with us and we are never alone. Bless all fathers and father figures who strive to love and nurture as you do. Comfort all who long to be fathers and all for whom this day is difficult. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Dear God, we pray for the work of the call committee of Christ Lutheran Church. Guide their work of discernment as they seek to bring forth pastoral leadership for the future ministries of this congregation. Hear us, O oh God. Reigning God, you bless us with guides and caretakers in the faith. We give thanks for those who have died. Especially today, we pray for the family of Pat Runyon, whose stepdaughter, Margie Boyer, died. Increase our care for one another until we walk with newness of life. Hear us, O oh God. Receive these prayers, O oh God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always.
Now we give thanks for the living word of God. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Send your spirit of truth, O God. Rekindle your gifts within us. Renew our faith. Increase our hope. And deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. It's taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
out into the world in peace, have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.